Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Today's short clip from The Vault comes from the Steve Cropper interview we shot back in 2008. Steve talks about how they recorded the great instrumental hit song, Green Onions. We hope you enjoy it. And if you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Hope you like it. Steve Cropper. Story behind Green Onions, uh, Jim Stewart had booked a Sunday session, which was more of a demo because we worked uh, five days a week, Monday through Friday, and all the guys, most of the guys, except for myself, had uh, night gigs, you know, they be, had to be on stage by nine o'clock usually, and doing four sets a night, sometimes five. And uh, anyway, we were there to cut an artist named Billy Lee Riley, who's pretty famous. You may have him hanging on the wall around here somewhere. And uh, Jim had talked to Billy about cutting some stuff on him. I think Billy had recorded over at Sun or somewhere. And uh, anyway, he didn't show up for the session and we were just kind of waiting on him and we were just jamming on some stuff. And, and Jim still expected Billy to show up. And um, we just started jamming on some blues just to kind of warm up our instruments and just kind of keep from being bored to death. You know, we're sitting there waiting on this guy. Usually it's the other way around. It's usually the, the singers waiting on the musicians to show up. <clears throat> but that day, uh, we were just playing and just jamming on some blues, just some, some blues and F that we would do on stage, you know, just to mark the time, to just add, you know, to the night. And uh, we finished it, and I remember if I still had the tape, uh, I remember in the end we just were laughing. We just thought it was funny, you know, hey, that's pretty good, da 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 And Jim got on the talk back and said, hey, guys, he said, come up, come up here and listen to this. And we go, what, you put that down? He said, yeah. He was already set up to record, so he just reached over and pushed the record button. <laughs> so there we were listening to this thing, and Jim Stewart just fell in love with it. He thought it was great, you know. And uh, it was a song that turned out to, uh, the title of it turned out to be the B-side of Green Onions called Behave Yourself. At the, at the time, it didn't have a title. But what was funny about it is Jim Stewart said, uh, he said, that's pretty good. He said, if we decide to put, put that out, he said, if you guys got another song you can put on the B-side. He called it the B-side, and we said, uh, no. I mean, we looked at each other. We didn't sit around and write all the time, you know. Booker and I wrote a little bit, and, and uh, I looked at Booker, and I said, I don't know. You have any I said, I remember you played me a, some kind of riff or a lick about two weeks prior to that session. And uh, he said, I don't know. He said, well, I think I might remember. And he goes out on the organ, and he starts playing the kind of the Green Onions lick that we know, you know. I said, yeah, that's it, that's it. So Al sat down, and Louis sat down on the bass, and, we start jamming on this thing, and, and uh, Jim said, that's pretty catchy. He said, you know, let's get an arrangement on this. And so we, we did this thing, and so Jim said, uh, you know, that's pretty good. He said, but Steve, he said, that thing you're doing in the middle of the song, he said, why don't you put that on the intro? Just do that on the intro and play a verse like that, then let Booker play, and then you do a regular solo. And I went, oh, okay. And that was the take. I put these chink things I was doing on the intro. Booker plays two verses, I played a solo, Booker played a verse, and that was it. It was out. And it was just sort of an accident in a way. And uh, so I, uh, the, the good part of the story, I, I love telling this part of the story. Uh, I went ahead and, and, uh, and leadered it off and all, and I called Scotty Moore the next day. For people who don't know Scotty Moore, I'm sure you do if you're watching this stuff, is he was Elvis's guitar player. He was also a guitar player for Sun Records and he also liked to engineer. He used to call me over to do some sessions because he wanted to engineer like Chip's Moman did. So I was this lucky guy that <laughs> got to play on some of these sessions. But anyway, I called Scotty and I said, you know, yesterday I said, well, I think we cut a pretty good song. I said, would you cut me a dub on it? And he said, sure, come on over, you know. So I went over there and we fired up, you know, and he fires the lathe up and all that. And he's, Man, Steve, he said, that's pretty catchy. He said, what do you call that? And I said, well, we don't have a name for it yet. I just said, I just know it's good. And um, I said, I'm going to see if I can get my buddy to, I want, I want one, of, one of my disc jockey friends to hear it. So he cuts this dub. The next morning, I go down to my friend Reuben Washington, who was on uh, uh, WLOK radio station. He had the drive, drive time slot. And I went down there, and I used to go down there and just hang out with him anyway. And we were kind of good friends. And he'd come by the record shop, and we'd hang out some, you know. And I said, uh, I want you to listen to this thing. I said, we cut it Sunday afternoon. Tell me what you think. So he put it on a turntable. He's playing another record on the air. And he put it on a turntable and he played the intro. And, he, and then he played about two or three bars of the verse. And he just stopped it and backed it up. The other record got through playing. He just hit it and spun it, put it out on the air. 
I said, is that going? I saw the red light come on that terminal. I said, is that going out on the air? And he said, yeah. And I said, man, I said, okay. I said, you hadn't even heard it yet. He said, no, it's good enough. He hears it, backs it up and plays it again. He played it four times in a row and the phones lit up. People couldn't believe it. They said, who is that? Where can we buy this? What do you call that? Da, 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 da. And they said, I can't tell you and there's no name for it, <laughs> you know. Anyway, we got through and he's laughing about it and all that. And he said, man, you better tell the guys to get serious about that, you know. And uh, so I went back to the record shop and they said, what did you do? And I said, what? And they said, the phones are ringing off the wall. Everybody's wanting to buy this thing that you had them playing on the radio. We were listening, you know. I said, you gotta be kidding. So we called Jim Stewart. He was still working at the bank, worked in the trust department at the bank downtown. And, and we told him, said, Jim, on your lunch break, you better get by the studio because we got, we got something going on here. And we told him, <coughs> excuse me. So we told him all about it and, uh, and he said, well, we got to do something. And it wasn't the side he liked, it was the up-tempo side. And so we called the guys in and we said, we got to get a name for this thing, get it on the label and so forth. And so I can tell you now that Louis Steinberg had played bass on it. When we're hashing around ideas, we came up with all kinds of crazy ideas. And he said, why don't you call it Onions? He said, because that's the stinkingest music I ever heard, you know. And I went, yeah, that's pretty good, but you know, onions is kind of a negative. I, I don't deal in negatives. I said, isn't onions a little negative? You know, they make people's eyes burn. Some people don't like them, gives them indigestion and all that. And I said, what about green onions? I said, a lot of people eat green onions, you know, with their dinner and everything like that. And they went, yeah, green onions. So that, that was the title. And um, I think the other title came about when, uh, on the flip side, the song I mentioned earlier, Behave Yourself, which was just a blues ballad thing. Uh, Al Jackson actually said on a session, "All oh, behave yourself," you know, like that, you know, and that's where that came from. So there we had the record. Uh, it, it came out as Vote 102. It was the second release on Vote Records, and uh, the the thing I, I jumped in the car on that Friday. Well, that that afternoon I went down and and put it in the vat. We made the stampers up. We had the, had the title and all that, and had that all printed up. Put the stampers on it. I put it in the vat that night. And on, let's see, that was a Tuesday evening. And Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I went down and I picked up a box of 25 records and got with my buddy Bill Biggs, <clears throat> who was a, a promotion guy that hit all the one stops and, and the jukebox operators and stuff. And I said, can I tag along and we go hit some of these stations? And he just thought that was a great idea, you know. So I jumped in the car with him with a box of records and we started hitting. Tupelo and Jackson, Mississippi, and went over to Four City, Arkansas, and then all the way to Little Rock, and hit all these things. And all of a sudden, then they all started playing this record, and they were just glad to see anybody. They said, "This is great. Nobody ever comes to see us, you know, in these little towns." And we got this saturated play on one weekend, and it just the calls came in like crazy because it really was a good record. And uh, Atlantic finally got wind of it, and they said, "You guys have a hit. One thing's wrong. You're going to have to get it off a of Volt label because we don't need to be promoting another label." So we put it on stacks and went down, we changed the stampers and got records the next week. Went to number one. Vote. 